Hey everyone, welcome back to the NPT Podcast. This is Will Crane, your host. Thank you so much for joining me as we go through the content that you need in order to dominate on test day. So if you haven't already, be sure to check out ptfinalexam.com for all the information you need. We have ongoing classes. Certainly, you're always welcome to sign up for our VIP program. The VIP program is one that I personally run. We go through all of the content you need on test day. We go through each system. We go through it in detail. It's a very robust course. And so if you're looking for something to get you across the finish line, the VIP course is the one for you. So today we have a practice question. This is related to the integumentary system. So we'll be talking through integumentary differential diagnosis. So on test day, you can expect somewhere around three to four questions related to integ differential diagnosis for a grand total of somewhere between nine and 12 questions on the integ system. Now, if you're listening to this episode farther in the future, so beyond 2024, you'll note that the actual total number in each category is going to change slightly. So we'll be updating our podcast, obviously, for the 2024 exam once we pass the October test date. But recognize that the proportionality will still remain approximately the same. So as always, my biggest recommendation here is as you are studying, make sure that you're studying proportionally. So therefore, you'd be spending about 75% of your time in the big three systems, cardio, musculo, and neuro. Now, that doesn't mean you can't you can just forget about all the other systems. Certainly, you'll need to spend some time in all the other systems, and that's why we go through these as a part of the podcast. But as always, be sure to check out all the other episodes we have going through all of the body systems. And again, as you recall, this podcast is just dedicated to taking you through all of the body systems on exam day. So today is no different talking through the integumentary system. So those of you watching the version over on YouTube, you can follow along with the question. If you're just listening along, that's fine too. I will read to you the question, give you a moment to respond, and then we will talk about the answer together. All right, so here we go. A patient presents to the clinic with a severe rash extending unilaterally in a narrow band from the left lumbar spine into the left inguinal crease. The patient reports that the skin lesion has been present for seven days and causes severe pain. Multiple vesicles are visible along the surface of the skin. Which of the following conditions is most likely present? So we have one, contact dermatitis, two, herpes zoster, three, lymphadenopathy, and four, thrombocytopenia. So we have one, contact dermatitis, two, herpes zoster, three, lymphadenopathy, and four, thrombocytopenia. And again, the patient is presenting to clinic with a severe rash extending unilaterally in a narrow band from the left lumbar spine into the left inguinal crease. The patient reports the skin lesion has been present for seven days and causes severe pain. Multiple ves vesicles are visible along the surface of the skin. Which of the following conditions is most likely present? So this one is, is clearly talking about herpes zoster virus, also known as shingles, when you have a reactivation of the herpes zoster virus. So in this case, where it is a narrow band along the L2 dermatome, and that's what's described as starting from the lumbar spine extending into the inguinal crease region, we're talking about L2. And so that's one of the common sites for, for herpes zoster reactivation to occur or for shingles to occur. Shingles is characterized by this narrow unilateral dermatomal band that gets, gets multiple vesicles as well as a rash, a severe rash, typically described as a burning and extremely annoying annoying pain extending across the, across the dermatome. So that's one of the key characteristics of herpes zoster. This would be in an adult who had chicken pox as a child or the herpes zoster virus as a child. Typically it's a childhood illness, but then it gets reactivated either from, a, from an autoimmune attack or for no particular reason at all. You can get the idiopathic presentation of herpes zoster extending across the dermatome band. Now, very commonly, it is in the thoracic spine. It can be on the face as well, down to the lumbar spine. And so the real key here is looking for a unilateral presentation without any other specific precursor. And that puts you on the, certainly on the list for a herpes zoster reactivation or shingles, the shingles virus, so to speak, especially in the adult patient. Now, of note, if a person who has shingles is exposed to, or if a person, I, sh I should say it this way, a person who has not had the chickenpox vaccine or the, the varicella or herpes zoster virus 
vaccine, if they've not been vaccinated, it could be the person, <laughs> the person with shingles could communicate the illness to the person who is unvaccinated. So they are transmissible. I guess that's what I'm trying to say, that the shingles virus can be transmissible to the unvaccinated in the case that they they come into contact with someone. And it's it's extremely, extremely contagious. And so any contact with the patient is likely to result in infection unless the person is vaccinated. And so this is especially important, not only for the unvaccinated, but for the unvaccinated pregnant woman, where it could it could have some some deleterious effects on the pregnancy. And so therefore, it's of paramount importance to recognize when you do identify shingles. And then the second step is to make sure that you limit contact and exposure with those who have not been vaccinated. Now, typically speaking, in a healthcare setting, you receive all these vaccinations. And even now, uh, childhood illnesses are, are, are you know, significantly less than what they used to be. I know, I remember getting chicken pox when I was in grade school. So does that make me an old person now? Um, but I do remember getting chicken pox in grade school and how it was uh, kind of an unpleasant experience all around. So I suppose down the road, I do have a risk of developing herpes zoster reactivation or shingles. So it's definitely something that if you can or if you have not ever been vaccinated, worth spending some time getting that done and then limiting exposure from the patient with shingles to someone who has not been vaccinated. So all that to say, this is a presentation of herpes zoster or shingles. I can almost guarantee a question on the test related to this just because it's so prevalent and it's easy to write a test question about this. So other items here, contact dermatitis, this is typically related to some type of contact, some irritant, some skin irritant, whether that's adhesive or some type of material being placed on the skin. Some people are extremely, extremely likely to develop contact dermatitis. And in fact, if you treat anyone post-operatively, you see this all the time that that in the you know, whatever operation they're doing, you know, if they're doing some surgical procedure, they have to scrub the skin down. And then once they're done, they tape it closed. They put some type of adhesive material on the bandage or bandaging system, which can be extremely irritated, irritating to the skin. And I'm, oh my goodness, I've seen giant blisters, little blisters. The key with that is just to protect the skin as best you can. I love skin prep. If you're familiar with the, the chemical skin prep, it creates a, a small film barrier. It's this, it's like an alcohol swab, except that it makes, it creates a barrier from the adhesive to the skin so that you you can tolerate it a lot easier. Uh, lymphadenopathy just refers to swollen lymph nodes. So this would be in the case of like cancer or malignancy, infections, autoimmune disease, anything that has swollen lymph nodes. And then thrombocytopenia, this is a more widespread issue where you get petechiae, petechiae, I think is how you say that, petechiae, where you get the little, uh, uh, almost like small arithmetic mottled bruising just because you have poor clotting and so you start to develop these little micro bleeds under the skin. Typically has a purplish, deep purplish, dark red hue to it just because of the, the leaking, very leaky blood vessels because of the, the, low platelet count. And that's what thrombocytopenia is, is a low platelet count. So all told, they can, all of these options, contact dermatitis, lymphadenopathy, and thrombocytopenia can present with some type of skin or integumentary issue. However, the key here is that because it's in the dermatome band, it's got to be the, the herpes zoster reactivation or the shingles virus, so to speak. So all right, with that, we'll bring it to a conclusion today. As always, be sure to check out all the other episodes we have. I try to get lots of good stuff out to you to help you on your NPTE journey. As always, we do have courses available to you if you need help or need help or a boost along the way. We can definitely get you going in the right direction. So in the meantime, we'll crane fist pumps all around, and I'll catch you in the next episode. Thanks. Thanks.